raw video I have that will help hopefully give people a better concept that haven't dove it and um, plan to dive it. So I was in the Marines a long time ago now, 20 years for a while. Uh, when I got out of the military, I really wanted to go scuba diving and I was going to school, I uh, was working in construction. I just really didn't have the time or money for it. My One of my uh, coworkers, one of the contractors uh, was a scuba diver. He mostly went for lobster. I would always ask him detailed questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? What do you do for this? How does this work? And uh, I think he got tired of my questions and one day just comes and gives me my paperwork and says, uh, have this done by next weekend, you're starting your open water class. And I, I think like most people are like, wait, what's open water? He's like, that's your scuba cert. Just So he paid for my cert and uh, I loved it. I've been doing it ever since then. Um, and I've tried to do that for other people and I, I'm testimony of that. Um, I got a, I got a message one day. Hey, what are you doing February, you know, twentieth or something like that? And I'm like, no, nothing. Why? What's going on? What do you want to do? And then basically you hung up on me. I remember that. And then call me back five minutes later. Was, hey, I got you signed up for open water. I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then that's been a really great thing too. Like you've really progressed and you've helped a lot of other people. And um, it helps, you know, the rising tide raises all boats. But um, I, I, I didn't want to come into the talk like beating my chest, look how great I am and I do all this and whatever. When I started off, I was using gear that was from garage sales, uh, hand-me-down stuff, and I slowly progressed and I mostly did shore dives, cove dive, uh, whatever's cheap and easy and lobster diving in the jetty and um i you know you get bored of that and you kind of progress um my progression mostly hit like in 2009 i started diving the yukon i started diving more i'm like taking it more serious but i also had a really healthy fear of like going inside of wrecks and i i i knew i was getting in over my head a little bit and i didn't want to go much farther uh because i'm aware of, of everything, but I, I, I would dive it. I, I had a great time in very much way. Diving the Yukon is like being in the military and you're on a ship, except for there's no one there to tell you, oh, you can't go here. You can't go here. You can't do this. You can pretty much do whatever you want. You can swim through, you can check this out. You can check that out, you know, just walking down. You can do, it's like going to the midway or the Missouri where you can walk down the hall and have a great time doing that. But they don't really let you go check stuff out. They don't want you to do anything. In I think it's 2009 or 2012. I don't remember uh, offhand. It was probably 2009. I was like, okay, I'm going to do, it was a great day on the Yukon. I saw, I could see right through it everything looked great. And I'm like, oh, I can go in there. Oh, I want to check that out, but I'm going to get, I'm going to get trained first. So I started doing that. And then where my jump was, was in 2012, I went to Hawaii. Uh, that's when I met Ryan. I don't think he liked me because I didn't know what I was doing yet. It was the first time I actually did some, uh, uh, some dives where I wasn't freezing cold and, and like taking a cold shower and you know, air consumption didn't matter and because you're only at 30 feet and, and everyone's like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh man, I better really step this up. And when I came back, I realized I have better get a dry suit or I'll become a vacation diver. And uh, once I had a dry suit, I didn't care winter, summer, how cold, whatever. If you do, if you're in a wetsuit on the Yukon, you probably don't have 15, 20 minutes until you're cold. So even nitrox doesn't really help you because you just get cold. Once I had a rebreather, it's, I mean, uh, once I had a dry suit, it was well worth it. And then I, I, and I still have this suit. I've upgraded since then, but by the time I'm done, it's something like $2 a dive for a dry suit. And it's an upfront investment, but man, when you're underwater and you're sitting there shivering, just, oh, I think I'm going to go back to the boat. Um, you'll, you'll, you know, you drop 50 bucks right there to not, to not be cold. Um, but I should remind you, you should probably put on a hood and gloves. 
I hate hoods and gloves. <laughs> I hate hood. The water gets trapped in your ears. Uh, you Anyways. can't feel what you're doing. But yeah, with the dry suit on, it's a nice thick undergarment. Uh, it's like wearing a snowboarding jacket in the uh, the winter. It's a, it's not as it's not as bad. Um, and then I've gone. I got bored of doing that. I started doing tech diving. I got bored of doing that. I started uh, taking pictures. I got bored with that. I started doing rebreather. So um, I say that to not push people. Um, there's a lot of like progression, and some people will try to come up too fast and it's like wait wait until you have your skills down so well that you're not paying attention to it and then everything becomes really easy and here's like one of me it's another one that drew took inside the uh, missile tower with everything on the camera so that kind of gives you an idea of like what i'm doing on this, this side of with this side of the pictures um so enough about me that was probably way more than i actually wanted to say but when you dive the Yukon, if you remember from Dick's talk, it's laying hard on its side. So it it actually gets kind of disorienting. It's a little deeper. The sister ship to the Yukon was sunk up in Canada. It's standing up. It It's super shallow. It's like 35 feet to the bridge. Um, but I don't want to get past myself. So it, it gets pretty big. You can see it's on its side, uh, which actually works out really good in, well, penetrating. Um, but uh, it's something that you'd want to plan for because you're not so used to that. And then there's a lot of safety things to that. There's a lot of steps we take. There's a lot of things we help to make it better. Um, but what I want to do is walk kind of from the bow to the stern um and go over key features and then go into some of the life on it and then go on to the inside most of the people that have been diving it for a while uh, like to go down burma road which is on the inside and one of the things i love the most about the yukon is it works on every level um, which is great for multi-level diving if you ask nate nate but if you ask Ryan, it's done. But what I mean is you can have a great time on the outside. And then when you get bored of that, you can start checking stuff out. When you get tired of that, you can start going up and down Burma Road. And when you get tired of that, you can start going there. So it doesn't matter if you're really new to diving or have been diving for a long time, you can, uh, you can have a great time. So these are the dolphins that they cut out. You can see the picture here where they cut it out um, before they sunk it. And that's a nice key feature. Most people like to see it. You can actually see they cut it on both sides. So it makes for a good picture. And just as a little bit of trivia, um, that cutout, um, the missing metal piece is actually at the DUI factory um, above the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I think you mentioned that in the tour talk. Um, most people don't even recognize it's dolphins. If you go there, it just looks like a cutout. You have to take a step back to see it. But when you look up or down, it's very apparent. It's pretty close to the sand. That's actually when you're taking the camera, sticking it on the sand, and then taking a picture up, uh, me trying to get through there. But it's more than, it's large enough to swim through. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a nice feature uh, to know to go in, to come out of. You can figure out pretty quick. Here's the Ford guns, which is where most people come to take pictures. And it's actually really hard to take pictures of, but that's that's my attempt of it. Uh, everyone seems to really like it. Uh, they get really excited on there. You can see how the there's like a haze. So it's kind of hard to see through, but you can make it out. It's even harder to take a picture. And a lot of times I'm using a neared wide angle lens because it's perfect for taking pictures of people, but um, it makes it really hard to take pictures of features. Right. And also the dive site itself, um, because it is out in the open ocean, you have um, as the tide swings, currents change, you can go from, you know, 20 foot visibility to 60 foot visibility one day or more. And then turn around and it's like all of a sudden it's a night dive right in the middle of the day. So it just oh. depends. 
Yeah, it is interesting. Sometimes the morning dive has 60, 80 feet and you're totally blown away. You come up for your surface interval, you drop back down and it's like 20 feet. You're like, what the heck happened here? It's, it's the upwelling, the downwelling. Um, this is the best picture I had. It kind of shows the, the guns themselves. A lot of my uh, military buddies, I'll point it out underwater and see if they can figure it out. But there's uh, no rifle bar barreling in there where it rotates like a, like a rifle or a pistol where you see the grooves on the inside. And it's also significantly thinner than you would normally have uh, because when they sold it, they weren't allowed to sell the guns because it'd be considered weaponized. So these are actually uh, lamp posts that they used. Very imposing lamp posts. Yeah, no, but and it's fun. I mean, like I, I remember him being new, you come down and you're doing like the Doctor Strange love pictures and it's, uh, it's fun. There used to be like a fish that lived in there all the time. And it, you can tell just by the picture about about when it when it is um yeah so and then these are these are just i mean it's the great it's a great picture of it you can kind of get a depth feeling there you can see the other divers and you can see the guns but that's like the um the main attraction and i think if you go from the last one to this one you can see how sometimes even if it's pretty clear out it just gets dark because you are getting you are getting uh, deep there. Um, moving down towards the bridge, these ones look really awesome, especially from the inside, because you have all the cutouts from the windows, and then of course the windows aren't there. It's a little it's a little too small to get in or out of, but uh, you get man, you get so much light. You get all these strawberry and enemies on there. You get so much life uh, on there. It's just super great. That is a good day. Side mount diving, you can get through there, by the way. Well, I mean, I can do it on my rebreather, <laughs> but I wouldn't encourage anyone uh, to do it. Um, I've, I've done it with my side mount set up and then went up between dives. And while everyone's having soup in the, in the galley area, I come walking in and everyone kind of starts giving me the, the face of what is that smell? And they, turn around and they look at me and I'm covered with strawberry and then you goo from me squishing myself through the window. <laughs> yeah, the look on your dive buddy's face when it's like, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you, so um, this is just a picture to help kind of highlight where all the fish are. You can see that's really laying hard on its port side. And you can see this is one of the ascent lines where the where the boats tied off so there's there's four of those i'll get into here a little bit later but it's a nice way to um you can you can find your way out of there really quick but that gives you a nice concept of the orientation of the wreck itself um this is a good one of the the tower or the is milt's tilt but the 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 it's actually not even a smokestack it's just it's the it's the tower um, there's a ton of sea life on there. You can usually see pretty good. This is like the main area where, where people go. Um, here's a picture of the smokestack. The smokestack actually fell down a couple years ago, but it was a nice um, turnaround point for people. And then this is where most people is. You can kind of see there's a couple people that were just coming by. There's some people at the line going up. So most of the people congregate there and they all seem to have a great time. Here's a picture of Andrew, just because I figured Andrew would be watching. Um, there's the picture of the old flag, and you can see divers just having a, a great time there. That was just a random couple that saw me taking pictures and decided to to jump in. Um, so can you yeah. give a little history of why there's a, a flag on the, on the Yukon there? Yeah, so, so um, a lot of people don't know this. Yeah, there's kind of a backstory on there. Uh, I don't think it was unfamiliar, or unusual to have flags on there. I remember when I first dove it, there was a pirate flag on there, where the uh, the flag used to the flagstaff was, and then that went away, and then someone put a raider's flag on there, and then um, which I they went, probably took down. 
who knows? Um, there's, yeah, there's always haters out there, right? Um, so I, I, I still have a pirate flag, the like surrender the booty Jolly Roger flag that we were going to go put down there to replace replace it, but the flagstaff came down. Um, so, I mean, it's it, part of it gets weathered. Um, the, um, so there's, it wasn't unusual to have a flag on there. I think even down on the left side, there's been like a Navy flag. I'm pretty sure there's a Canadian flag by the mooring right now, no big deal. Um, there was a diver that was a Marine that um, ended up losing their life on there. Right, and there's uh, a plaque in that, in that eight place. Eight years ago, yeah, and right here is the plaque. And I would go all the time and then scrape it off because uh, she was in the Marines, I was in the Marines, I, you know, uh, just like looking out for your own or whatever, just a nice sediment. And one Memorial Day, I decided to put the Marine Corps flag on there and I didn't think it would last long. And I think uh, people seem to like it. And then 4th of July, they're like, hey, let's put a, a American flag on there. And then it became a reference point for quite some time. So people, oh yeah, we went down to the flags and then we turned around. Well, this this smokestack went, came down a couple years ago. Um, Charles and I recovered flags. We put the plaque up uh, on top side. Some people get, you know, why is there a American flag on there? It's a Canadian ship, you know. Then there's another Canadian ship like this up in uh, Canada. I'm sure they have a Canadian flag on there. Um, there's another one of the sister ships down in Mexico. They probably have a Mexican flag on there. Once you move a vessel to another port, um, you usually take that country's flagship. So I don't think it's unusual or weird or whatever. I, and I don't think anybody, I don't think it really makes a big deal. If someone wants to stick another flag down there, they can stick another flag down there. If somebody wants to stick something else down there, put their dive flag down there or their whatever. I don't, it, it's fine. You know, like it's, it's a big open wreck. Have fun. Um, and so now every year, it's kind of just been a tradition. Every Memorial Day and Veterans Day, we go down there and we'll replace the flags. People seem to like to do it. We always get a big gathering. It's the same as we replace the mooring lines pretty frequently. And, uh, people like to be a part of that and it's nice to maintain it and keep it clean and uh, it, it does great for for pitchers and uh, people like it so I don't see any harm in it some people get perturbed by it but you know whatever they have a photo up in the factory at, at DUI of of this area with one of the with the flag the U.S. flag flying on it I am well yeah have fun. I, I like it. It's a, it's a good for photography. I didn't expect it to last long. It stayed around. It's fine. It's fine by me. Uh, let me progress. Um, you also find a whole lot of the fans and a whole bunch of life on there. It's the only life in the whole entire area because it's an artificial reef. Um, there's a lot of little creatures in it too, but that's like part two of it. Um, and it's all over the place. They used to have big Gagordians all over it and it, they come and go. You get a whole bunch of strawberry and enemies. You can see that on the deck, not, maybe not so much, but everywhere else, you, it's just absolutely covered in it. And it makes a really nice, uh, like you don't even see the wreck anymore. It's all you're seeing is sea life. You can, you can be going along the side and then it just looks like a very well uh, maintained reef. Uh, as opposed to just sand out there. So it definitely makes for better pictures. Uh, and then you get a whole bunch of sea life on there. It's like a sea star just hanging out. Definitely bring uh, lights when you dive this because that um, it goes from this, obviously everyone knows that the colors disappear as you go down the depth. And this is deep enough that um, having a light will make the colors just jump out at you, so. Oh yeah, it looks very washed. Um, black and blue, black and gray without um, bringing lights. Uh, this is another example of just all the cutouts there. There's so many cutouts, but there's not as much there, but you can kind of get in and get out, but it kind of gives you a feeling. This is on the um, on, on the hall as opposed to up above. So you can find your way around pretty easily just by looking at what's around. This is actually one of the exhaust vents from the engine room. 
if I remember correctly, we actually came out of the engine room there. Um, but just going back farther, there's there's so much to to do there. It's great. Um, here is it's actually a picture of me, Jason, and I switch. So I get a picture of myself. That's the the screws, and you can see there's a whole bunch of fish and life that just hangs out there. Maybe not so much on the hull, but everywhere else. Um, that's the backside. And so you get like the fish, you get the. Uh, so as as an artificial reef, it really seems to be attracting a lot of life. It's yeah. You can't even you can't even other than the part of the hull here. You can't even see the metal. There's there's all sorts of snacks on here, uh, which is great. And then here's the the rudder and you can just see all the life just hanging out on it. Um, people a lot of times get bored they forget to look at the small stuff. So I have a little section for the, the macro. There's actually a ton of nudies on there all the time. They switch, they shift. Sometimes you get more of this one, sometimes you get more of that one. There's definitely months where you just get a whole like diverse group of nudie Bronx everywhere. Um, I like this one. I took a picture, it's like hanging out one of the anemones. Um, but you get a whole bunch. I don't, you'd have to ask her about the names. Rebecca renamed them all. Um, these guys are cool because you can see the little eyeballs on the openings. It's really hard to see without a camera, but um, it's, it's just amazing. There's a bunch of lobsters that hang out. I think most of these pictures were all on the exact same dive. Um, and you just go along. These guys look like part of the anemones that are just hanging out on the side, the sponges. Um, you get a whole bunch of fish just chilling out, the rockfish, a couple more nudies. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. Um, and then it's also easy to, to take pictures of because they're hanging out off the reef, reef uh, the wreck. You can be down on the side and then take a picture and it's like right in front of you. Whereas if you go out on the kelp beds, most of them are so low, you can't you can't look through the camera eye view. So most people will pass these without even looking at them or not even notice them. And I, uh, when I guide people, I take people I haven't been there for, I try to sh point them out and it, it, it takes them a minute to start seeing them. You can see a whole bunch of different, uh, different kind. Uh, and then there's just fish hanging out. This guy's interesting because he's like looking up at me, but it's <laughs> but I got a picture of him. I just showed you how much higher I am than the uh, camera. But yeah, there's a ton of sea life. One of the videos at the end is just there's fish everywhere. I didn't have any good pictures of that because it's really hard for a camera to focus on a thousand fish swimming around. Uh, these ones are super common uh, back by the bridge. Uh, that takes me to Burma Road. So people that are certified to uh, dive inside. Um, it's it's actually a lot of fun in there. Uh, Jack can contest that. The, um, even on a bad day where it's like kind of gr not great viz on the outside, I'll, we'll just go on the inside and, and people ask, oh, how was the viz? And it's, it's wall to wall on the inside and we just explore in there. We go up and down. Uh, it's it's really nice because Burma Road goes all the way from the bow to the stern. So you can go from the bow to the stern and back um, on one dive without having to go deck to deck. Um, you wouldn't be able to do it on a single tank, but um, when you start doing more technical dives and you're going into, it's perfect for, um, it's really ideal for just regular wreck diving because it's at such an angle. Like they have slates that show um, all the decks. But if you imagine a regular wreck, the silt's gonna be all on the bottom. But with it laying like this, all the silt goes to the bottom here and you have all that room to swim with. And cause it has cuts out on the side, most of it just washes out. So it's really easy to swim through Burma Road and have a great time if you're new at wreck diving because you're not going to silt it out. Um, there's a few dead ends and a few places you can silt it out, but uh, you can pretty much pop out um, at, at any time. Uh, here's a good example. We staged some lights, but there's an opening up top. There's opening on the sides. So you can come out at any time. Um, right. So as you're going through, 
um, as far as like uh, an overhead environment, if you definitely dive this during the day, it has a different feel. I know at night, um, at night it's a totally different feel. But during the day, I know we had had the light shining through like that. Mm -hmm. um, it always gives you the ability to stop, take a right turn, and just exit the wreck, you know, or look up and exit the wreck. So there's right. a lot of ways to, of safety to get get it back out of the wreck. Uh, exactly. So, and I have a good picture here in about two or three slides. Um, there's a lot of areas where there's a complete overhead environment. I think this is in the engine room and there's like two big cutouts in there. Um, but you'll go through and there's some like some light up here. So this is the main corridor. You can see there's just tons of room up and down. You get a lot of light shining through and particularly when I was new and I didn't know this wreck like the back of my hand, I would go up to a bulkhead and I'd bury my light in my chest. And if there was like a copious amount of light, I would go into the next room. If there was no light, I would just find another way. Cause there is a few, there is a few dead ends there. And if you're leading four people through um, <laughs> and you have to back up the caboose isn't so happy with the engine, but um, that's a, it's a really good um, way to go. There's a good example there too. It's not it's a dark picture. It's not the best picture, but I use this one because you can see there's if you were to go up to this bulkhead, you can just look up and see. Okay, there's a big opening. There's a bunch of whatever, and you can kind of go. And then because there's four mooring lines on this, uh, pretty much no matter where you come out, uh, you're always really close to a way up. And it's also in recreational dive limit. So even if if need be, you could just go to the surface at any time. It wouldn't be ideal, but um, you, you can. Uh, and then this is a good example of where you go through and you can't see anything behind. You can see another diver back there. Uh, I realized how many like late night um, dust dives I do where there's just not a ton of lights, but I bring a ton of lights. Uh, this is a good picture of the Ford magazine. Uh, it was a warship and had four inch guns. These are where all the shells go in. Um, most people have a hard time finding that. Um, I really like it. It looks really cool. Um, and there's actually a bunch of toilets on there. I love, wreck divers for some reason love finding toilets. I'm not sure why um but i have no problem pointing them out to people i know i know where they're at and we'll go along i'm like look at the the toilet <laughs> and then they're <laughs> people are like what what I, like, I, oh. I have i have many pictures of me sitting on underwater toilets <laughs> i don't i don't understand it but i have so many especially traveling where it's like hey get a picture of me and the guide's like what are you doing and i don't know i'm just having fun uh, here's another good picture of where the, the exit's at. Um, there's not much left. There's like a handful of slides left. Um, Go on. Um, we, I do have, we have a question about the sister okay. ship. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the Columbia it had a fail, failure of the mast. Um, the smokestack is still intact, though. Um, so that ship is about at a 40 degree angle is the main mast of the Yukon still in place? Uh, yes, the only thing that's so there's a back deck that pilled over in a storm many years ago. Um, no one the... really noticed it. The smokestack collapsed about two years ago, um, but a lot of the pipes and stuff is still coming out. So like the if you think of like a jet engine where it has all the pipes and stuff on the inside and then it has a cover, the cover fell, the rest of it's still there. Um, it's starting to lose some handrails, uh, but the the superstructure itself is there. There's uh, some like modular walls on the inside that's starting to go, um, and there's like every once in a while there'll be a, like an electrical panel that falls down, is hanging by the wires, and we'll go and snip the wires off so it's not an entrapment hazard. Or there's um, air blowers for like HVAC that has fallen and you just kind of push it down um, right. so, so that it's not an obstruction. So that's good to know that, um, you know, the regulars, the dive masters and the prof dive professionals that are going out on 
on these dive boats um, and diving in the wreck all the time are also helping keep it clean and keeping it safe because um, obviously things change over time. Yeah, there's definitely been people that try to tag along with me and they get <laughs> surprisingly bored at just painstakingly cutting stuff or snipping this or changing that or moving whatever and it, you don't go far and it's not a great dive. Um, I changed one of the mooring balls uh, like a month ago, maybe two months ago now and it was a great day. It was great viz. It was great everything. And I just went down, did what I had to do, come back, went to the surface, changed it, came back. And like, how was your dive? I'm like, I didn't even get a look around, but um, it's, it's good to keep all four mooring balls available, not just for people coming, but if, if you're expecting an exit, um, the exits there. Um, I think all the wrecks are slightly different. If I remember correctly, the, um, I think that's the one down in Mexico, and I think it's it's much farther down. Um, I think it was sunk like five years prior to the Yukon, so it's probably more weathered. Yeah, so I know the the outside of the wreck on the Yukon when when there is incredible views, um, those are the days you want to sit there and be, and you kind of like go out and just look at the whole superstructure, and you're able to look down and see entire parts of the ship as a whole and it's just uh it's it's a pretty incredible sight yeah it's it's there's definitely times when we've gone down and plan to penetrate or go down burma road and then we end up like it's just amazing viz you're on the you're on mills tilt i can see the forward guns i can see the aft guns i can look up and see the boat and you're like wow we're not going inside this day is amazing and i brought the wrong lens um but uh usually you end up with a um a haze layer in there so right so so some of the other other ships uh some people uh, okay i got a question here it says in canada we've had quite a few former crew members of ships and various ranks have their ashes interred on the former navy ships um have there been any interred on the yukon um i'm not familiar with any but i haven't heard of any i i i seriously doubt um, they do. Um, I don't. I, mean, I never even considered that. Um, I, I I know I've I've heard of uh, people who've been crew on the Yukon, came down and and then had dove, dove the Yukon. It, yeah. yeah. Um, I know there's a really strict um, policy on um, like the um, Arizona where the crew gets interned there and there's a really strict criteria to that. And I also know that um, uh, ships that have, uh, that are considered tombs or uh, have fallen people on there, it's it's actually, I think, a federally restricted. So you're not allowed to dive on them. So I'm assuming that there's, the answer is no, because I don't see, I don't see them getting permission to do that. If someone went and just spread ashes um, I wouldn't be too shocked by that, but I, I like, I, that's probably not a bad idea for myself, but, uh, I, now that I think about it, but, uh, um, I, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of it. I haven't heard anyone do that. I'm sure the rules out here prohibited in some way, although I wouldn't be surprised if eventually someone does that. I'll have to look into that. That's an interesting one. Um, so I know there's been certain things hidden amongst the stuff in general on the Yukon. Um, I know that for a while there was a, a full size, you know, fake skeleton that was being put around different rooms. That was fun. Um, that was, it was definitely fun. I, I startled myself once because it wasn't in a place where I, I knew where it was like the day before. And then someone moved it into this other room and I turned the corner of like, ah! What's that? Yeah, um, I think that was Chad. That was so much fun. <laughs> and then if you're taking people through, you're like, oh, crap, I forgot about that. So you'd have to like move it or something so that they knew it was fake. Like, I'll have to get there first. It was worse when it was falling apart and someone just find like a bone and like, oh, ah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's a prop. Yeah, I've, I've played that joke on many people. Also, you know, it's like, OK, it's, I know where it is now. It's a, it's it's around the corner in the engine room and that. I'd say, hey, go over that way and look, you know. <laughs> there, 
there's a lot of fun times. <laughs> um, so a question just came in is why do they call it Burma Road? I don't know. I I don't know that one either, other than it's just a, a straight shot from uh, the bow to the stern or stern to the bow. I'm sure it's a terminology. It's probably in like some kind of a naval thing. If I remember correctly, we had one on um, one of the LHDs. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think it's just one of those common words that, maybe not common words, but a common term that the Navy uses and people overlay and then don't don't understand why. I'll have to Google that. Um, yeah, I think I got like a handful of slides. Okay. Left this getting a little long. Um, so uh, yeah, like I was saying, I, I used to take groups out. Um, I, I try to make it as safety oriented and as much information as possible. So I want to find something that uh, could provide a service for people that want it, people that just want a credit, they can get credit, people that need a little bit more time and can actually get some. There's a lot of uh, information there. There's there's knowledge, there's good description. I you know explain where all the, you have to be able to write where all the mooring lines are, the key features. Um, most people get thrown off um, by little things that when you explain it and I'll take people out, they're like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a lot bigger than I thought, but he said that. And, oh yeah, he said, when we get here, we'd be turning and oh, oh there it is. And um, uh, they'll start going down and it's, it's really hazy. Like, oh, I think I should go back. And it's like, oh, wait, wait till you get down. You get down about 70 feet, you pass the haze. Um, and it's really nice. And so I thought I could do something that would help the dive community out here. It's something that people might want. Um, most people have just been people that dive it that want to do it but the the intent there was uh, for safety and I've I've been in since then I've pretty much just done it for people that just ask um hey can we do this and um I've been trying to like well maybe in the busy months like the last Sunday of every month or make a a structured time to do that uh, a lot of times what happens is uh, when I'm DM in the boat and somebody asked to do that, um, we go ahead and do that. Um, but it doesn't really happen uh, very often. Um, but it's like a service I wanted to per provide um, because there are so many different layers of, of people that go um, and want to dive. So you actually get a Yukon diver card from Patty. Uh, a lot of people like to collect cards. I've done that myself. I like to get recognition for stuff. Uh, I like to check in with oddball ones just for fun when I travel. But the the purpose, I'll read it right out of the thing, is the purpose of the Patty uh, HMCS Yukon Diver Specialty Course is to educate divers on ways to safely dive on the outside of the Yukon by learning to prepare, plan, and organize their dives, become familiar with and identify main characteristics of the vessel. Sorry if I talk too fast. Um, to aid in locating their position underwater and avoid becoming disoriented. Uh, a lot of people have a hard time with it going sideways or they, it's so big they're going down that they gonna oh, have to get back to the boat. And you're like, no, it's, we've, turned around the wreck was on our left side now the wreck's on our right side um and 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 they just mistake the moorings um so that's the idea their divers will navigate and avoid potential hazards uh, to easily locate safe SF points divers can also apply these skills they have learned in this course to prepare plan and organize their future dives on similar wrecks and artificial reefs by utilizing the same techniques uh, you can definitely tell people that come in from out of town and have done a lot of wreck dives. They have no problem with stuff. They can go from one to the other. They can navigate it very well. Um, there's a lot of hazards too where cutouts, um, they get sharp over time and you can cut your hand on it. Um, there's a lot of like poles and stuff that break off and then it, you know, there's pokies and uh, even going one of the videos I have, I wanted a picture. I couldn't find a picture of the the engine, but there'll be a big opening, and you like look up, and there's a giant um, transmission sprocket there, just you know, hundred tons of steel. And uh, um, if you're not paying attention, you have to <laughs> you'll hit your head on it. I think everyone's done that, but uh, if you are aware of that and you watch out, then you're less likely. So I try to get a couple pictures 
that um, that kind of show that that's more specific to the Yukon. Um, so a lot of times the current will be going one direction, like south, and the wind is blowing toward the shore, so like east, and you actually get a, a difference on there. So a lot of times people won't hold on to the more in lines, which is fine when it's calm, but sometimes uh, when you hit about 20 feet, it has a radical turn. Um, the you can see here in in visibility. Um, it's hard with a picture, but the if you can see my cursor, the guns is just this little part right here, and that's as far as you can see. So if you imagine you go all the way down, it's roughly it's 366 feet, so it's roughly the same size of a football field, field goal to field goal. Um, so you know you can imagine uh, if you swim 80 yards away, uh, it, it might be hard to get 80 yards back, or like oh man, did I did I pass the exit? Did, did I pass the exit? Uh, wait, is this my exit? Oh, oh, I think I went too far. And then, and then you can, you can um, just be lost on the wreck because it's that big. It does make it easy if you are, are descending down on like the bow, because it's like, oh, dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's also harder at times too, because it's down at 85 feet instead of 65 feet. So sure. You can say, oh, I have five minutes my NDL left. And by the time you get there, not only has it been four minutes, but you're now 20 feet deeper and your NDL is now gone. Um, this is a good picture of the how it's clear down below, but then gets hazy. It's that algae la layer um, that cooks off. And I believe this picture is actually the Ruby E, but it um, you can see like the, the haze the haze layer uh, there. That's not super uncommon, but you're going past it. That's why I really like doing the wreck dives out here on the boats versus the shore dives is you just avoid uh, all that because you have that at the shores too. You just have to get deeper to get past it. Um, and the first size and scale, like all these little people are normal size people. The wreck's just uh, really big. So if you, you know, imagine you're Oh, someone can draw on the screen. That's cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's the Yukon. Um, uh, hopefully somebody learned something there. I want to throw a couple of videos on just as I take questions um, because there's like a leg and a legacy issue with Zoom and um, it's super boring to just watch a video so I figured it can be on whatever uh, and then it's really ideal for questions I'm sure people have patiently been waiting for questions <laughs> so anyways I keep forgetting that um, other people can draw on there with their phones not on the computer <laughs> um, so one of the questions has to do with the uh, composition of the Yukon, um, because uh, I guess uh, this is from Jay. One of the, one of the initial. Well, hang on, just big comment just shifted my whole screen. Uh, one of the initial concerns of starting these Canadian Navy destroyers is whether there'd be significant electrolysis at the aluminum steel interface of this in the superstructure. Have you seen any signs of this? Um, if there's what of the superstructure? Electrolysis. I assume that's where the two metals are meeting. It, it creates like a, um, a deterioration, you know, where uh, the two materials are are breaking down, so to speak, under underwater. Um, I mean, I know I've seen- I'm not the, an engineer and I have really no reference of that, but I haven't seen any parts where the, the ship's coming apart um there's right i've only uh, i've seen you know i mean obviously the smokestack falling down during that storm yeah um, i saw the rear uh radio tower um that was interesting diving that right after it happened seeing the the raw metal and the thickness of it and going wow that was peeled back just like it was a piece of paper <laughs> yeah uh well you know water's eight pounds a gallon just over just under just over uh, ah, so so here we got uh, DJ Mansfield 
filled us in on Burma Road. Um, Burma Road is a Royal Canadian Navy speak that described the main passageway of the ship. Oh, he's a smart guy. Um, so he was also in the military for a very long time. (laughs) To go deeper, Burma Road was critical road during World War II, linking Burma. Now, anyways, it goes into a, a long description um of but anyways it, it's referring to the main passageway oh that's great there's always somebody that 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 uh can pick up on that information he's a really smart guy he's a really smart guy he's up at beach cities scuba that's good i didn't know that that's good information that's why we're doing this i mean it, that's well that's why i'm doing this is because one i get to learn a lot of things um in a lot of cases, I want to learn about dive sites that I want to go to, like the Truck Lagoon. Um, in this case, this was I wanted to share one of my common dive places that I go to and that I enjoy diving. Yeah, this is my favorite dive site around here. I mean, you can get something bigger in Micronesia if you, you know, but that's six grand. Um, you, you come out here and dive and it's just over a hundred bucks for two, three dives and you can spend all day on there. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, there's a bunch of people that like to go. It's something that's here. There's a lot of people that come in from out of town. So there might be people like in uh, Texas that come in for a conference or something. And um, you know, while they're here, they want to go dive somewhere. Uh, it's it's on the it's on the chilly side. That's why earlier I was talking about like. Um, it, you know, it's really, it's well worth the price of a dry suit just so that you can um, actually do a, a longer dive because it, it does get chilly out here. Um, it, that is something that a lot of people forget when they, I know San Diego, we, we have warm weather throughout the year compared to other places around the U.S., um, but people forget that the water is actually cold here. Um, they come out and they they could be vacation divers and they're used to diving, you know, in no wetsuit or thin wetsuits. And they come out here and they're diving, you know, seven mil suits or they haven't dove in their dry suit for a while. Um, it's always good practice to do other dives before you go and do this one right away um, in the cold water, just so you get that, mm-hmm. that practice. So you can go down here and actually enjoy these wrecks. Um, obviously, you know, going inside, you shouldn't go inside unless you are skilled enough for this and your comfort levels there. Because as you can see, and especially in this video that you're showing, it's there are a lot of room right here. Yeah, there's definitely some entanglement areas that you could get kind of stuck in. Yeah, the entrance and exit here is like in the roof. Yeah. So a lot of people go to the wrong side and then can't find their way out and like, oh, look up. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely agree with you. There's people that um, come in from warmer water and they say, oh, I, I always dive a three mil and I'm fine. And you're, you're, no, you're, you're not going to be fine. Or um, there's, uh, I've had people come in from Florida that, oh, I just go with the, the current. And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've dove in Florida before. The boat follows your bubbles. Um, right. So but here we're moored off or anchored. So if you're, if you're going with the current, you're going to have quite the swim when you get to the surface or you're going to have to wait for everyone else to get back on the boat to get picked up. So I know on, on some dive locations, um, there are certain restrictions on different ways of, of diving um, or certifications. Um, so one of the questions uh, is about penetrating the wreck. Is it required to have a line or, um, or can you just go in through the cutouts? Um, I know that I have run lines in here more for practice myself. Uh, most of the time I just swim through, but I'm also um, relatively familiar with the wreck myself. So it's, there are no local rules that I know of that says you have to have a line when you go inside this wreck. I don't think there's any rules. There's definitely like etiquette. Like if you go in and trash it for someone else, but that's also based off your skill level. So if you just finished your wreck class, that's your only way out if you silt it out. So that's probably not a bad idea. You can probably find a way out because you can see like in this video, there's an ample amount of light coming up, uh, but you can silt it out or go to the next room. Uh, like, I, like I said earlier, uh, I would, in some parts, it would be kind of pointless to run a line. There's some good, decent swim throughs. If you don't know, 
uh, which ones are swim throughs and which ones aren't, I would, I would lay a line. Um, there's a lot of like techniques you can do to minimize that. And like, like I said, there's a lot of dead ends there too. So there's, um, there's places in particular, even on the Yukon, if I go, uh, I'll lay a line from the inside in, but, um, there's, there's, there's different preferences, uh, and most of that is just based off your skill. I don't think anyone's going to like police it underwater. I don't think anyone's going to come down and right. shake a I mean, fist at you. But if you lay a line across an opening, uh, people are going to be pissed. If other people are just swimming through and you go in and silt it out, um, people will probably likewise also not be so happy with that. Right. And, and people need to understand that this inside the wreck, it's always changing because I know there's been certain hatches that have um, doors have opened up that used to be welded shut mm -hmm. um, for safety reasons that are now open. Um, and that anyone going inside of a wreck need to be really, you know, cautious of it. Just don't blindly go inside of some room. Um, you know, again, stressing the don't go beyond your dive limits. Well, if you even follow the wreck course, the first dive should be just on the outside mapping it. And then the second dive is with a line and slight penetration. Um, you wouldn't want to go uh, too far. So um, obviously, if, if it's your first time doing it, I would recommend you going with somebody else that knows it well. Um, and then if you're not too sure, there's no real harm in, in uh, laying a line um, but, uh, like you can see here, the opening is so mass, I don't even know how or why you would lay a line there, but, uh, I think the one to the right is a dead end there. And I think the one in the middle goes forward, but one of those is a, a dead end too. So, yeah, there's a, there's a few spots that get kind of thin and tight. Um, but if you're visiting, you know, and, and, and if you're not 100% comfortable with diving the wreck. Um, a lot of the different dive charters have access to dive masters um, that have dove this hundreds of times that can lead you on a tour either on the outside to keep you safe or go, um, you know, into safer areas of the ship, um, so to speak. Yeah, I've, um, I've guided people that were uh, divers that are either dive instructors, dive masters, have hundreds of dives, and you're like, wait, why am I here? And they're like, I just want you to show me where all the good stuff's at. I have three dives, and I don't want to look at sand the whole time. And you're like, okay, I'll show you where all the cool stuff is. Uh, I've had right. people come in that have advanced wreck, and they have this, and they want to do that, and they want to see it out. And I, I actually have like different routes. I take different people, and um, when, when I get divers with a lot of experience and a lot of training, the first thing I do is there's a section below the sand at above below the wreck and above the sand where the cutouts are. And I'll, I'll take them in that way and I'll reevaluate their confidence level <laughs> right. and then see how much exploring uh, we're going to do. But that's where that multi-level, multi-layered uh, dive. Right. So one of the, one of the questions is, um, Right now in, in San Diego, we have two um, main charter boats that will go out to the wreck. Um, one is Water Horse Charters, and that's the one that you work with. Yeah. Um, they go out regularly, uh, pretty much every weekend, um, weather permitting. Um, and the other one is Marissa Charters. Um, both, you know, are located in places that um, have easy access to these wrecks. Um, or wreck alley, so to speak, and they'll have different combination dives like a double Yukon or a Yukon Ruby E or some of the, you know, NOS Tower and some of these different places that you can go to. Um, and of course, you know, once this whole COVID thing is getting a little bit lighter, there'll be more places to go to and talk and, you know, enjoy a beverage after the dives with, with your dive buddies. Um, let, Things are a lot of things are closed right now. In other words, yeah. Oh, of course. And um, yeah, they 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 all. I like I like the I like all the boats. Um, Marissa does a great job. The water horse has been like family to me for a really long time. Uh, try to help out where I can. They do a good job. They've always done me right. Um, I just spend so much time. Like I I I see them more than I see my own family. So I'm. Uh, more than willing to help out where I can. And then like even just maintaining the, the wreck 
uh, there's spots open I just go with um, I usually do overflow or like for a tech trip or whatever um, so I get a lot more time uh, diving but it's a really small it's a really small dive community and everyone's trying to help out and everyone's really kind of positive so I have I have a I have a great t- time okay so we're we are running out of time on this now um, if if you can unshare your screen it would be great um, and then I'm going to do this. Um, so I thank you, John, for coming out and presenting. Um, this is great. It's, it's good to see the local dive community, you know, and their involvement with these, you know, dive locations, um, especially with COVID, not everybody's able to travel to, you know, faraway lands that there's places, you know, in our case, local in San Diego that are awesome dive locations that you can go to. Um, and definitely around the United States, there's, there's a lot of diving that you can go to um, just right next door, so to speak, sometimes. So, mm-hmm. so I appreciate your sharing with us all this information. Um, yeah. Hopefully I uh, helped add information or someone, ha- everyone had something to take away from it. Probably talk too fast and ramble too much, but. Uh, uh, that's normal. No. <laughs> try, try, <laughs> try, I try. Um, so. Before we sign off here, um, again, this will be posted on on Facebook. um, So you'll be able to play it back there. Um, It will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, There'll be links to it from the divedui.com website. Um, So you can always get there that way. Um, And just as a brief little teaser, um, next month we are having a presenter from the East Coast, from Florida, um, Casey McKinley. He's going to be talking about uh, the Woodville Karst Plains project in Florida. Um, so that should be pretty exciting uh, and very informative. Looking forward to that one also. So thanks, John, for coming out and, and sharing. Yeah, and um, if anybody wants to do the specialty, um, most people just end up contacting me directly uh, yeah, so on if you- Facebook or whatnot, or you can just email the water horse and uh, ask if you're going to be in town and you want to do that, you just ask, uh, right. ask them and they'll, we'll try to schedule. They'll so try to can, schedule. I don't do the scheduling at all. Okay. So if you can um, post that information on the Facebook um, feed, that would be great on the, the video for this. That'd be perfect. Oh yeah. Sure thing. Okay. So uh, we're going to end this and thanks for coming out everybody. And we'll see you next month. Uh, look forward to it. Thanks. <laughs>